Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Chanel Cleeton to discuss The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba, a captivating new novel inspired by real life events and the true story of a legendary Cuban woman, Evangelina Cisneros, who changed the course of history. Chanel Cleeton is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of Reese Witherspoon book club pick Next Year in Havana, When We Left Cuba, and The Last Train to Key West. Originally from Florida, Chanel grew up on stories of her family's exodus from Cuba following the events of the Cuban Revolution. Her passion for politics and history continued during her years spent studying in England where she earned a bachelor's degree in international relations from Richmond, the American International University in London, and a master's degree in global politics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Chanel also received her Juris Doctor from the University of South Carolina School of Law. She loves to travel and has lived in the Caribbean, Europe, and Asia. I'll be moderating tonight's conversation with Chanel. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christina Nosti, and I'm the events director at Books and Books, where I've worked for close to 20 years now. It's been a wild ride filled with stellar events, and each one is better than the next. But we're so lucky to have authors like Chanel, who know and love us and have supported us during these strange, to say the least, times. Um, throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba from Books and Books Below and support your locally owned independent bookstore. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Chanel to the virtual stage. Welcome, Hello. Chanel. Thank you so much for having me. Sorry, <coughs> you caught me mid, mid cough. I'm so sorry. <coughs> Take a. Do you have some water? I do. Yes. Yes. Take your time. Happy book birthday. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm so sorry. I'm at the tail end of a cold, so it kind of comes and goes. Um, but Don't thank worry. you so much. I love doing these events at Books and Books, and it's always just so wonderful um, to chat with everyone. And so I'm so thrilled to be here this evening. We love having you, Chanel. We're so grateful to you. So it's great to see yeah. you. You look beautiful. Yeah, Congratulations. You. Um, so let's jump right in. So do you want to tell us about The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba? Why sure. did you write this story? So for me, the inspiration for the book actually came on a research trip when I was down in the Florida Keys and I was researching the last train to Key West, which was my release last year. And while I was there just sort of for fun, I decided to visit the San Carlos Institute and it's a Cuban cultural heritage center in Key West. And they really had a, quite a bit of information about the fight for independence from Spain. And it was a period of history I really didn't know that much about. I grew up in a Cuban American household. Um, my family came from Cuba in 1967. And so I very much grew up on kind of their memories of Cuba and their stories. But for my family, so much of um, the things they told me really centered around the revolution and around their life in Cuba and kind of their experiences in the aftermath of the revolution. But I wasn't as familiar with more distant Cuban history. And so for me, it was really fascinating, you know, living in kind of this hyphenated identity where the American side of me, you know, I've learned quite a bit about American history in school, um, but the Cuban side of me, I've not necessarily had that same experience. And so I was really fascinated to kind of try to understand where my ancestors, you know, came from, what their lives would have been like going back generations. And so this, this event really sparked a lot of curiosity for me. And while I was there, I also visited the USS Maine Memorial, and there was quite a bit of discussion about the Spanish-American War and the USS Maine. And so I started to kind of get this idea of it would be so interesting to write a book on this subject and to learn um, a little bit more about, you know, more distant Cuban past. And so as I started researching, 
I really was just immersed in this larger than life world. Um, it was such a fascinating period in history. And I was really surprised that I hadn't read more books about it and hadn't really heard more about it. And then as I was researching, I came across the true story of Evangelina Cisneros. And she really was um, kind of, for me, one of the rare exceptions where I think um, real life really adapts so perfectly to fiction. It was the first time I've written a real life heroine and it is often hard. You know, our lives don't typically follow a, a novel format, but with her, um, the events of her life were kind of more dramatic than anything I could have come up with as a writer. And I was just so gripped with her story. She was very much kind of an international celebrity at the time. She was a Cuban revolutionary who was falsely imprisoned by the Spanish. And she was um, sent to the kind of notorious woman's prison, Recogidas in Havana for rejecting the advances of a Spanish colonel. And while she was there, her story came to the attention of William Randolph Hearst, who was the publisher of the New York Journal, which was one of the big New York newspapers at the time. And he was sort of locked in this fierce circulation battle with Joseph Pulitzer for um, newspaper supremacy in New York City and saw her as an opportunity to kind of use her story to get the United States involved in um, this war between Cuba and Spain for Cuba's independence, and also to obviously sell more newspapers. And so she really became kind of a, a celebrity in the United States and everyone knew who she was. And her story really um, kind of catapulted the US's interest in Cuba in that time period. So it was really fascinating to, to learn more about her and her experiences. And then in writing her story, I created two fictional heroines. Um, one is Marina Perez. So if you've read my earlier books, you're familiar with the Perez family. And I created a Perez ancestor. So we went back in time a little bit um, in Perez history. And Marina is actually um, in one of the Cuban reconcentration camps. I was not familiar with this until I started researching the book. But there were hundreds of thousands of Cubans who were sent to Spanish reconcentration camps in Cuba. And it was a really difficult time in Cuban history. Um, the people in the camps, you know, passed away from disease, from starvation. And so she's one of the women who's sent there and she finds an opportunity to work as a courier and to kind of spy and help the revolutionaries. Her husband is off fighting in the countryside and she's someone who's very patriotic and very passionate about the cause for Cuban independence and wants to get involved however she can. So she does this while she's in the camp. And then my other heroine is an American journalist who is sort of modeled after Nellie Bly, if you're familiar with um, Gilded Age journalism. But she is very much kind of looking to make her mark on the New York newspaper scene and gets involved with the story and, and involved with this um, quest to kind of free Evangelina from prison. So this is your first time writing about a real person as yes. one of your heroines. Uh, what were some of the challenges with writing a real person? You know, it, it was definitely interesting. Um, I think for me, I, with historical fiction, I really like to follow the historical narrative as it, as it occurred. I don't like to try to shift the timeline too much to fit my narrative purposes, which can definitely be challenging. So with her life, um, as I mentioned earlier, in some ways it was really adaptable to fiction just because um, it was so extraordinary in terms of some of the things that happened to her, some of the dramatic points. I don't want to spoil too much in the novel, um, but the basically the journal becomes obsessed with breaking her out of prison. So you can kind of see where we're going in terms of some of the events that um, that take place. But it was really important to me, particularly given how much um, her story was sort of co-opted by the American press to be as faithful um, to her story and feel like I was telling her story as she would wish for it to be told. Um, one of the things with her is there was quite a bit that was written about her, but she was someone that was famous for a very short period of time. And then we know less about her in kind of the later part of her life. And so it was hard sometimes to get her perspective on events. You know, you would get the narrative that was crafted around her identity, um, but kind of digging through those layers and getting a sense of who she was as a person could be challenging at times. Um, there was an autobiography, and I kind of use that loosely in air quotes, um, that was written about her, but it was published by Hearst. And even in the autobiography, you kind of see some of the same propaganda and narratives that you saw in the articles about her. So on one page, you know, you would get the sense of this very strong, 
independent woman who was kind of organizing her own jailbreak. And then on the next page, she would kind of change to be someone you didn't recognize. And you would start to see more of kind of Hearst and his reporters prose creep in and the way that they would describe her. So it was definitely um, a, a challenge to try to feel like I really knew her enough to kind of live in her head um, for the time that I was working on this book. But the one thing that really shined through for me was just her passion for Cuba. I mean, it was definitely clear her family sacrificed a great deal for um, Cuban independence. Her father fought in the earlier wars and then was going to fight again. And that's when he was captured and imprisoned um, and she was going to go with him to fight. So clearly you saw a family that sacrificed a great deal and, and believed in the cause of Cuban independence. And during her, her notoriety, she really tried to use the platform she was given as much as possible to raise awareness to the situation in Cuba. She went on speaking tours uh, throughout the United States talking about um, how dire things were in Cuba and trying to get the U.S. involved, um, which obviously was a little bit controversial at the time. There were kind of different um, schools of thought on whether or not U.S. involvement was actually a good thing. But she definitely tried to use her platform um, as much as possible to bring awareness. And so I wanted to, to capture that love that she had for her country. Um, she was asked how she wanted to sort of um, epitomize her story. And she said with the cry of Viva Cuba Libre, because for her, that was such um, an important thing that she wanted people to remember more than her personally it was just the cause of Cuban independence. So did she speak to you a lot? Did you... Did you have conversations with her? Did you hear from her as you were developing the character? Were you in conversation with her? I, I Can you was. tell us about that a little bit? I think it was a lot of trying to put myself in her shoes. Um, I think with all writing and with all of the characters that I, I create and I work with, that definitely is something you do. I mean, even when you're writing a character that might be a villain, you know, you want to have a level of empathy with them because you live so much in their head and you want to bring them to life for the reader. And so you have to kind of understand what makes them tick and what drives them, what are their flaws. And so I spent a lot of time with her really trying to sift through kind of what felt like the noise, I think about of what people said about her and, and to understand um, who she was. You know, there were things that became noticeable. One thing I would say is she spoke very little about her family, but when she did, um, you understood the depth of her emotion. And when you looked at the facts of her life, um, when her father was sent in exile to the Isle of Pines, she chose to go with him, even though she didn't need to, um, because she wanted to be with him. And that's what kind of put her um, on the Isle of Pines when the Spanish colonel came. And, you know, you saw that kind of love she and her sister went, that she had for him. But this was also still a really tumultuous time. I mean, even when her autobiography was published, the conflict was still going on in Cuba. So you get very much a sense that she was trying to protect the people that she was very close to. Um, there were people that were involved with her case that she used code names for, because even at the time that this was published, she didn't want their real identities to be known and for them to be in jeopardy because of it. So you really got the sense of someone who was very loyal, um, someone who was very protective and someone who was very passionate. And I think using those kind of qualities to understand um, some of her motives was really helpful for me to get a sense of who she was as a person and, and the decisions that she made. So you have Evangelina Cisneros, and then you have Grace, who mm -hmm. is the young journalist who wants to make a difference with her reporting. Um, and she ends up in like an all too real battle between Hearst and Pulitzer, um, the two tycoons uh, who were aiming to dominate the news cycle. Um, as a writer, did you find yourself identifying with her role as a journalist or what kind of research did you do to inform this part of the story? I did a lot. So this, um, the thing about this book, I always say is kind of each of the subjects on their own could have been a full novel probably. Yeah. Sounds um, nice. So yes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I read about over a hundred, well, read, listened to, and kind of watched over a hundred sources preparing for this. Um, and a large part of that was reading about the newspaper wars. And part of it, I will admit, was it was just so interesting. And I wasn't familiar with this history as much. Um, so I would kind of go down a rabbit hole. And then it would just, you know, spark my curiosity and it would take me somewhere else. But I think it was definitely helpful having Grace be in a slightly adjacent profession to what I do. Um, there were times that 
she would sort of, you know, I would research. She, I, I think of my characters as though they're real life people. And, and anyway, that's, she would, that's what um, I have heard <laughs> from writers always. Yeah. So there were there were times that she would um, lament in the book about kind of the struggles of trying to make it in the journalism scene and the pressure that she was under and the fact that it was kind of like one story would make or break your career and um, feeling like you were trying to be heard in a very competitive marketplace. And particularly for her as a woman in the Gilded Age, um, being in this position. And so I definitely related to that. I mean, I think writing um, can be kind of a, a highs and lows career at times. And so um, having kind of that non-traditional uh, experience definitely resonated with me. Um, you know, there's some times we're blocked as writers and I gave her times when she'd be working on a story and she'd be sitting at the typewriter and the words just weren't coming and she was frustrated. And so I think those connections were definitely um, ways that I felt very close to her. And it is nice to have those. I try to give all of my characters some kind of kernel of my personality or, or some trait that I really identify with because I find that when you might get lost in a narrative or you might be stuck in a story. It's really helpful to kind of have those threads that you can tug on and, and to take you back to the character and, and to kind of having that relationship with them. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, we also see uh, Marina Perez. So we have her. Um, how does she fit into the Perez family tree? Can you tell us a little bit about her? So she is a, an ancestor and she's kind of a new branch that we're gonna meet. Um, so a little bit of a spoiler, but my next book will be out next year and um, I explore her branch a little more fully. So she is someone who kind of grew up in, in an affluent family and then married for love and made a decision to kind of break away from her family. And um, she's a mother, she's in the camp with her mother-in-law and is someone who's um, very passionate as well about the, the cause for Cuban independence. Her husband's off fighting and she very much misses him, um, struggles with that distance. And yet at the same time, you know, she wants to be there with him. She wants to be contributing in, in any way that she can to the fight. And that's how she becomes involved um, with Evangelina story and with um, her work as a courier. But she's also someone who's very loyal and dedicated to her daughter and, and knows that um, in this really difficult time, you know, she's there to kind of watch over her and make sure she's okay. So I really related to her story. Um, she, her story was very moving for me. Um, she really kind of represented for me a lot of the women that I was reading about um, who were involved in the, the fight for independence and just the ways that they, you know, would all be involved. There were women's clubs all over the country where women were fundraising and trying to send aid to Cuba. Um, there were people who were working as spies. There were people who were in the countryside. You know, you had women who were nurses um, who were traveling with the army and helping out. So there were a lot of um, examples of just really strong, you know, incredible Cuban women during this time who were sacrificing, sacrificing quite a bit um, for this fight for independence. And a lot of them really saw this as an opportunity to perhaps advance women's rights in Cuba and then, you know, things didn't quite turn out, I think, the way that they had hoped um, for a lot of these women who, who were fighting and who, you know, gave so much to the cause. But it was their stories that really kind of moved me and inspired me to create her character. And is that why you decided to tell your story from three different points of view? Um, because, you know, you've got the three heroines. Um, who was your favorite to write and why? That's a great question. Um, I, I did feel like the story needed multiple points of views for a, a few reasons. Part of it was that with um, Evangelino's story, we were in, she's in Recojidas for most of her story. Um, and so she doesn't have as much access to the outside world to give the reader a view of what's going on outside of the prison. There were times when they would kind of cut her off from communication because they were, the Spanish were really upset once her case um, raised such a level of public awareness. I mean, the Pope was involved, letters were sent to the Queen of Spain. I mean, wow. it, it really was um, a very like big international incident at the time. And the Spanish um, were getting lots of letters home from the Queen and trying to figure out, you know, how to handle this problem. So they would cut her off at times from visitors and from reporters. And so she kind of had a limited point of view at times um, in terms of what she could show of the outside world. And the other thing with her story that um, was important to me, and I, I mentioned this earlier, 
was just in following her story, I didn't want to extrapolate too much. You know, I didn't want to um, kind of fictionalize too much of her story just because I felt like she was someone that had been through so much as a public figure. I wanted to kind of honor it as it as it happened. But because there is kind of a limited amount of material with her life that we know, it really dictated the flow of the story and, and what I could do with her character. I really wanted to give the perspective of kind of the geopolitical impact that all of this had. Um, that's something with my books, you know, with my background, I really love writing about politics. And I like kind of looking at these global intersections and how the political and personal kind of intersect. And so creating Grace's character gave me that opportunity to show the impact that this had and you know how the involvement of the US really played out in Cuba's fortunes. I mean, obviously I don't wanna get into too many spoilers, um, but if you know Cuban history, um, the US obviously plays an enormous role and, and the outcome of the Spanish-American War and uh, the fight for independence is very much influenced by them entering the conflict. So I wanted to understand and give my readers kind of that perspective of how the conflict evolved to that point and, and what the US's intervention meant and then why the US came in. And so understanding the newspaper wars really does, um, I think, kind of help the reader to get that perspective kind of on the ground. And then with Marina's, um, definitely just giving the perspective of what was going on in Cuba. You know, that was the really heartbreaking and devastating part of this book. Um, there were definitely very inspiring stories of courage and sacrifice, but also just um, very sad to see, you know, what people went through in this fight for independence. And then for the way that everything kind of turned out, um, that was also very sobering as well. So I wanted to give that perspective. And I think her story really probably was um, one of my favorites. You know, I'm very emotionally connected to this family. I feel like I've sort of traversed my Cuban heritage and, and history through writing about these books and, and through this fictional family that I've created. So I really felt um, that connection. I felt like I kind of got to time travel a bit. And, you know, it was one of those things where I asked my, my grandfather is 98 and I asked him, you know, his parents would have been alive and my grandmother's parents would have been alive at the time she's passed on. Um, but I kind of asked, you know, did you hear about these events? Like, what do you know about this? And I was really surprised he didn't really know that much or didn't have kind of family stories to share. Uh, my family was from the city and I do think the experiences were a little bit different because the reconcentration camps were mainly people that were coming in from the countryside that were reconcentrated into cities. So that might have played a role, um, but it was one of those things where, you know, you kind of wonder what what did my family live through or what were their experiences? And so I felt like at least through this fictional family, I got to have an idea of what the landscape was like, even if I don't personally know, you know, what it was like for my ancestors. When you're writing historical fiction, how do you balance fact and fiction? Um, do you ever change historical facts to fit the narrative of your book? I don't. Um, that's something I just, um, I think there are times my editor probably wished I would because we would kind of go round and round about some points. Um, she'd have a question about like um, Evangelina's family and I would say like, I don't know, it's not in her her autobiography, it's not in the record and I didn't want to sort of guess. Um, you didn't want to mess so, with it. So yes, it, it's tough though. I mean, it can definitely be challenging and I know that there are, um, you know, there were certainly some questions for me that I wished I could have sat down and asked her and understood. Um, she, it's hard because I don't want to spoil too much of the book because her life on its own is is just really fascinating. Um, but she sort of ends up with someone that it's a really interesting pairing. And I had so many questions about that too. Um, and so you do wish you kind of have those opportunities sometimes to sit down and, and talk to people and, and real life characters. So the book is set in the Gilded Age. Um, how did you choose the, how do you choose the time period for your books? Um, are you drawn to a certain period or does something else inspire your choice of subject matter and the setting? Um, and then also just to segue, how did you settle on the title of the book? It's such a great title. Oh, so thank you. Well, I felt I'll, I'll go to the title first and then, then talk about the thing. The title for me, um, I struggle with titles. So I really, that's, I think a lot of writers feel that way. And I always had this, um, when I first, before I started getting published, they always, like, I would hear people say, oh, your publisher sets the title, don't worry about it. And that's never happened to me. I always have to set my titles. And I always <laughs> wish that someone would kind of come in with, you know, some great intervention that that is perfect. Um, 
But with this one, the title came to me pretty much from the beginning. And it is the phrase that William Randolph Hearst used to describe her. Um, he said, let's call her the most beautiful girl in Cuba. And he put that all over his newspaper. And I feel like there's so many layers to that. I mean, it kind of perfectly, um, you know, kind of encapsulates the the drama of this era and the exaggeration that you saw in the newspapers. Um, because of course, you know, she wasn't the most beautiful girl in Cuba. She was beautiful, but you know, that was yeah, obviously it's so dramatic. Um, it's like yes. the most beautiful girl in Cuba. <laughs> yes, but they wanted to grip the public and he wanted to spend this narrative about her and her life. Um, she actually did not like the fact that they called her a girl. That was something she really objected to. So <laughs> she was 18 when she was sent to the Recogidas, 19 when she kind of became famous. Um, so she was quite young, but she very much objected to the fact that they called her a girl. She liked to, to be known as a woman. Um, but it was a, a title I think she really struggled with. And I mean, I think as a woman, you know, you can consider um, how much pressure there is with a label like that, especially when you're in a public facing role and, and people are meeting you and expecting you to live up to this sort of paragon of virtue that of course no one can live up to. Um, but there's also kind of, it's a story of, um, you know, what the, the mood of journalism was at that time. And, and I felt like her story in a lot of ways was Cuba's story in how much um, these narratives were crafted by, by American journalists to kind of frame the conflict the way that they wanted to in order to um, kind of get the U.S. involved in, in this war. So the title really, for me, it just um, kind of encapsulated so much of the book. And I, I was really pleased with, um, with that for... For her story and she really uses it kind of subversively i mean the the sense of being the most beautiful girl in cuba she really kind of um turns it on its head a bit and uses it to to advance what's important to her which is cuban independence and and to kind of um get support for that cause and then in terms of the time period you know i think for me it's just what speaks to me as a story you know often i will um get something that kind of grabs hold of me. It's it's an idea, it can be a person, it can be a character, and doesn't really let go. And that's when I know that it's it's a story I need to write. I mean, I still remember where I was in the keys on my phone, kind of typing up an email to my agent, being like, this is what I think I want my next book to be, uh, just because I really, you know, stuck with me. And I started to see the world sort of open up for what sort of characters would inhabit it. And, um, you know, what sort of stories I, I could tell with this. So for me, it, it really is just, you know, you spend so much time with these characters and you spend so much time researching these time periods. And so you want to feel like you're passionate about the subject that you're, you're writing about. You know, I think with going down this path of Cuban history, it's really personal to me, which really helps. Um, I feel like I'm learning so much. And it's opened up conversations in my family um, about, my family's experiences that I, you know, didn't know about for as much as, you know, they talked about things, I'm still constantly being surprised. And I think as older generations pass on and, and we lose family members and having that distance of exile, it's really um, meant a great deal to me to be able to have this kind of appreciation and, and to be able to understand it. So I think that um, that really guides the the stories that I, that I choose and that I write about. And I will admit sometimes I skip around in decades and in historical periods and that can make it so much more difficult for the research because I'm often like, oh, I'm starting from scratch again. You know, it would be nice if I stayed in the 50s or the 60s. Um, but I also feel like in a way I'm understanding the revolution from a new perspective. You know, I feel like going back in time, um, this event was like such a big thing for my family and I heard so much about it growing up but I didn't maybe have as much context of all the events that went before it and, and what life was like in Cuba for, for decades and centuries. And so having this opportunity um, has really just been fascinating for me and, and giving me, I think, a, a broader and deeper appreciation of what my family went through and, and what so many others went through as well. Um, all of your historical novels um, are centered around women's narratives throughout history. Do you find parallels between the past and the present in these stories? Um, and why do you think these women speak to you? I think I'm, I'm really drawn to stories of sort of ordinary women who are kind of caught up in extraordinary times. And, you know, I'm not entirely sure of what it is about that that sort of grips me. But, you know, I think 
the thing I kind of go back to because I started this historical fiction journey writing next year in Havana. And one of the things when I was working on next year in Havana that really stuck with me um, was the fact that my grandmother was actually pregnant with my father when the revolution happened. And I was trying to imagine, you know, what that must be like to, it was her first child, you know, in the fifties to be going through a pregnancy, this major change in your life. And at the same time, be living through a revolution and have so much uncertainty in your life and um, so much fear. And, you know, do we leave? Do we stay? You know, my family stayed through until six, um, 67, but you know, they lived through quite a bit in that time period and, and their experiences really um, shaped them. And I just thought about, you know, what that must be like and, and tried to, to kind of imagine, you know, the fears that she must have had and, and the things that she thought about. And it really just impressed upon me um, her strength and kind of her grace, especially with what they experienced coming here and kind of starting over. And so I think for me that kind of has followed me through all of my books, you know, with when we left Cuba, you meet um, the sisters when they've come to the US and, the, and they're in exile and they are starting their lives over and they're trying to kind of put that together. And then in the last train to Key West, you know, you have this hurricane coming and people's lives are completely knocked off their path. And with this book, same thing. I mean, it's really people who um, just find themselves in very difficult circumstances and are able to persevere and um, find hope in, in tragedy. And their strength and their courage is something that I just really love to kind of honor and to explore. And I think for women, you know, in history, we don't see women's narratives as much. You know, obviously we often see more of kind of a male perspective um, or these very famous figures. And so I wanted to write about people that, um, you know, maybe how did it touch them on, on a more personal level and in their daily lives and, and in an intimate way. Um, and with Evangelina, you know, she was someone who was famous for a moment. And then her story was very much kind of forgotten once, um, you know, maybe she wasn't as as needed in terms of rallying, you know, the U.S. to come to war. And so I, I thought it was important to, to kind of revisit her and, and, and what her story really means and, and what the impact was on Cuba. How long did you work on the book? Um, and can you tell us a little bit about your writing routine? Um, what's your process? What's your favorite part of the writing process? How do you, you know, how does that unfold? So this book, um, I'm trying to think. I probably researched, I started it, the idea of it in the summer of 2018. Um, and I think I want to say I started writing it in maybe late 18, early 19 and finished it um, kind of in late 19. And then I was editing it through the pandemic so it, it took me about a year, um, and then obviously we go back and forth and edits. A great amount of this time was research. So I, with this book, all of my books, I kind of changed the process a little bit depending on what the subject matter needs. So with Next Year in Havana, I sort of wrote and edited at the same, or wrote and researched at the same time because I had such a strong kind of foundation of the story I wanted to tell from my family and also from my personal connection. Um, that book is much more kind of me exploring my Cuban American identity and what it's like to have a connection to a place you've not been, um, but yet you've kind of grown up with this um, version of it in exile. And so that book um, really was just something that kind of poured out of me. With The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba, because I was not as familiar with this time period going into it, I spent a great deal of time doing research. And like I mentioned, I would kind of go down these rabbit holes of fascinating you know, research um, trails, but for me, that's really what shapes the story. So but I you find, really, but you love research, right? I it do. Sounds like I you really do. love it, and that you find all kinds of leads and yes. you know, all kinds of like information that kind of really feeds what you're doing. So it sounds like you really love it. I do. It's it's kind of like being a detective. Um, it's really cool. Like oh, you'll just nice. kind of seize on one piece. And that's, that's how I came across Evangelina. Honestly, um, when I first started working on the book, I didn't know that that was going to be one of my characters. I just knew that I wanted to, to write about this time period. And as I was doing research, I just came across her name. Like, I don't even remember the original source I found it in, but it was just a, like a sentence about her, you know, being a real life figure who was in the newspapers. And I just wrote her name down and was like, oh, I'll come back to this later. 
And then as I started digging, um, I was just like, this is such an interesting story. And I really found um, a place for where she would fit in the narrative of the story that I was telling. So for me, research absolutely shapes my plots. And it's it's such a hugely um, important part of, of writing historical fiction for me. Um, so what are you working on now? Uh, what can we expect to see from you next? So my next book is going to be out um, about next summer. And it is, we're revisiting the Prez family with one of the sister stories. So readers have been asking me to tell the other sister stories um, that I introduced in Next Year in Havana and When We Left Cuba. So I'm going to be exploring Isabel's story. And there's two other heroines. Um, it's set, it's dual timeline, 1930s, 1960s. So the 1960s part um, picks up where When We Left Cuba left off. And it's set in Cuba and Spain. And um, definitely it's it's a book that I really just sort of fell in love with. Um, I you know had written about her from the sister's perspectives, but being in her head and writing her story, I just really fell in love with her character. So I'm really excited for this one. It's with my editor. I haven't started edits yet. And I can't say too much, so sorry. Um, but we'll probably be announcing title and cover, you know, in the next few months. And, and I'm really excited for this one. But you seem like you're really, um, like you're on a roll. Like you really have, I don't know, gotten into a rhythm with, because I find that you're a, a very prolific writer. Um, has that always mm -hmm. been the case? I mean, are you just like finding um, that these things are just like, easier coming out of you, maybe stemming from the work you've done before? I think it definitely helps. So I wrote romance before I wrote um, historical fiction and I was doing three books a year. I mean, romance writers are so prolific. Even my three books a year was not prolific by romance standards necessarily. Um, but I think, you know, that definitely kind of got me on a path of just going from one book to the next and, and being in that rhythm. And that mm -hmm. was really helpful. And I think also writing is just really cathartic. Um, there's something about it, you know, I, it's very personal for me. I feel a personal connection with my characters. I feel like I'm exploring my feelings on different subjects um, as I'm writing. And so it, it's really something that I just, I get a lot out of, you know, I, I really love what I do and I really love um, being able to share these stories with you're, everyone. You're good at it. You're really oh, good at it. Yeah. Um, are there any plans to turn any of these books into films? Will we see them as um, a television series or a film at some point? There, next year in Havana is kind of in the works, so I, um, I, I can't probably say too much about it. And I'm, you know, you never know how things are going to turn out. It's always fingers crossed with them, that sort of stuff. But, but there's some stuff in the works there. So excellent, excellent. Um, were you able to continue? working during the pandemic? What, what was that experience like? Were you still writing? <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> um, I will be honest. Um, that was I. That was a challenge. So I was editing The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba and proofreading it and then finishing up, actually, if I'm being honest, writing my, my next book. Um, so it, it was a challenge. Like I definitely, I think, um, I feel like there were people that read way more in the pandemic than they were reading before and were like more creative. I was not one of those people. I just had a really hard time focusing and concentrating. Um, and, and still, to be honest, I mean, I think I'm feeling slowly more hopeful, but um, I, it was a challenge. And it was definitely one of those things where you just had to like sit down and, and do it. But the beautiful thing is I always find that I'm writing the book that I need to be writing at whatever moment in my life. And Isabel's story, um, she's been through a lot. And so I felt like anytime I felt afraid or sad or whatever, I just sort of gave my emotions to her character. And that really helped me kind of connect with her and, and was very cathartic for me. Great. So I want to remind everyone who's watching, because I have a few more questions, but if anyone would like to ask Chanel a question, all you have to do is just put it in the ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those. Um, and I will ask you, if you could have lunch with any one of the Paris family members, who would it be and why? Um. I think probably Beatrice just because I feel like she would have the best stories. Um, she's definitely sort of my most uh, dramatic heroine in terms of um, she's the, the heroine from when we left Cuba and she's sort of involved with the CIA with some of the um, anti-Castro movement. 
And so she um, just lived a very interesting life. And that was one thing that was really fun about this new book that I just finished is I really got to um, bring her back and kind of see her life and um, where we left her and when we left Cuba and um, her interactions with her sisters, which were always so fun for me to write. So I really, really enjoyed getting to revisit that. Um, are there any books that have served as a particular inspiration for you? Have you have you read anything recently that you've loved? Are there books that you can share with us? So I've read some amazing historical fiction books recently. Um, one of the things that's really great about my job is I often get to read books before they come out to, to do quotes. And so um, I read Island Queen by Vanessa Riley, which was phenomenal. Um, I believe that's out in July. And it's this really amazing story of Dorothy Kirwan Thomas. Um, she was a woman who was born into enslavement in the Caribbean and then rose to prominence to be um, one of the wealthiest and most influential um, people in the, the West Indies in colonial times. And so she has a really fascinating life. And, and it, um, it's called Island Queen? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's by Vanessa Riley. And really just a beautifully told historical fiction. I really recommend that one. Um, I also read uh, Natasha Lester's upcoming book, The Riviera House. And that one's out, I think, in August or September. And it's um, set in World War II, but it's kind of dealing with art theft um, and uh, the protection of art um, with the Louvre when the Nazis occupied Paris. So that's a really fascinating book. Um, and also Sisters in Arms by Kaya Alderson. She's a debut author, or debut historical fiction author, and uh, that one's coming out, I believe, in August. I'm and writing these down. Yes, no, that one's that one's <laughs> so really I, wonderful. That so sounds great. They that. sound great. So we have we do have a few questions here. Okay. Um, here's one from Anna Viciana Suarez. Hi, Anna. Um, she's saying it's a one. This is a wonderful conversation, and she would like to know where in Florida did you grow up? And how did that affect your Cuban American identity? That's a great question. Um, I so I had kind of an unusual. I moved around a bit, but I was born in Gainesville, and then we lived in the Dominican Republic actually for a few years, and then came back to to Florida. And I spent most of my time in Gainesville, a little bit in Orlando, and then a little bit in South Florida. But I would say, um, you know, my childhood was really spent in in North Florida. And I think for that, my Cuban American identity really came from my family. You know, I didn't have the benefit of growing up in um, a huge Cuban community. Uh, we would go down to Miami. We had family down there. Miami is the first place that my family came when they came from Cuba. So we had a lot of ties there. But I didn't have, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier. It wasn't like there were Cuban restaurants in, in Gainesville in, in the 80s. Um, mm -hmm. And or Cuban supermarkets. So I remember my grandparents would like drive down to Miami they would stop up the car with food and come back and you know we would eat everything and my grandmother cooked cuban meals every night they lived with us um and so you know they really gave me you know cuban culture and and cuban history in the house i mean we spoke spanish at home um you know my grandmother made cuban food all the time we were always watching the movie Sion together um so for me it was this really personal connection um sounds and, familiar <laughs> yes. No. And, and, you know, I'm so grateful to them for that because I think not having had that connection, um, it would, it would have been unusual. You know, I, I would have felt, I think a little bit kind of disconnected. So they really um, brought Cuba to life for me at home. Um, and then, you know, just being able to go down to South Florida and, and having those connections, um, you know, I think if there was like a Cuban person in Gainesville, my grandparents knew them. Um, so they definitely, <laughs> you know, did their best to create a little Cuban community. Um, but it, it, it was something, you know, definitely it's a more, um, it was something I learned at home more probably than, than if I'd lived in a, a bigger city or somewhere where I had that. So someone is asking whether or not we have signed copies of the book. And right now, I believe we do because I, I think, think so. you sent book plates. Yes. So yes, the answer is that we do have signed copies of the book. Yay. So if you order your copy, just press the green button. We will have a book plate inside the book. And I think it's a really pretty one, too, that will go with your book. Um, so here's another question. Um, you said that writing during the pandemic was hard. So someone would like to know, how do you get out of a writing or creative rut? Do you have any advice? So 
I'll be honest, for me a little bit, it was just deadlines. Um, to do a book a year, I'm on pretty tight deadlines and I don't have a lot of extra room. Um, so just because of the production schedule for my publisher. So a lot of it was just, I knew people were expecting a book from me and if I didn't sit down and write, um, it, would, it would be a challenge. I think just in general though, you know, for me, reading is such a huge outlet. I find that reading other people, reading other genres is really helpful to me. It really inspires me. And it also lets my brain kind of escape to somewhere else. So if I'm blocked on something or I'm worried about something, it's this really great way to um, to sort of loosen up those those creative tensions, I think. And, and I find that to be really helpful. Same thing with watching uh, TV or movies. You know, I I didn't read as much during the pandemic, but I consumed media in other ways. And I find that even that creatively can be really helpful. I know some people working out can help, you know, just taking a break and getting fresh air. I think you have to kind of find whatever works for you. And it's not necessarily um, a one size fits all. It's it's just if you feel like you're stuck, try some different things and, and see what works and and see what helps you to to feel you know, like you can get back to the story. And I think also not pressuring yourself to worry about like those early drafts. Um, I definitely just write, you know, cause I have to hit a word count and I can fix it in revisions, but if there's nothing there. Do you there, just like spill it all out, just mm -hmm. like write, 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 and then yes. not worry about, you know, you go back to the structure and the editing and everything afterward. Yes, no, absolutely. And, you know, I will admit the more you do it, the first drafts get a lot easier, you know, it gets a lot cleaner just because you kind of learn, okay, I do this, so I need to not do this in my first draft and you, it kind of becomes intuitive almost. But I think just having that freedom to, to put what you want on the page, because often, you know, we're our harshest critics and at the time you'll think, oh, this is terrible, but then you'll revisit it, you know, a week later and it, it's actually not and you have something really beautiful and usable there. And so I think just having that freedom and, and sort of trusting your creativity can be really helpful. Uh, Marlene would like to know, can you describe how your family members have responded to your writing about your heritage? Your love of family and heritage comes through in your writing. Bravo. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think they're proud and, and, and happy about it. Um, you know, it's been really amazing. My family can come when I do the Florida events. Uh, my grandfather I mentioned is 98 and he's been able to come to my book events. Um, he came to my event at Books and Books um, when I was there for next year in Havana and I did the Miami Book Fair and he was able to come for that um, and got very emotional. So definitely I get emotional. <laughs> um, so it, it's been really special. Um, I will admit, you know, I think my family didn't necessarily see me doing this job. Um, and I, I, in my bio, they talked about I, I went to law school and I think they had different, different visions. So it's been a little surprising. If you are Cuban American, you probably know what I'm talking about. I do. Um, I so, really do. Yes. No one thought I would end up working at a bookstore either. Yes. Yes. No, mm -hmm. but I mean, they're proud. And, and I think they, um, they love that I've kept this, this part alive. So. So somewhat, so Michelle, this kind of leads into her question. What does your grandfather think or say about you publishing books based on your Cuban heritage? I would think it might be an honor for him, especially since you say you didn't grow up in a Cuban community. So your heritage mostly came from your grandparents. Absolutely. No, ab absolutely. Um, you know, and my dad was born in Cuba, but he came over when he was a boy. So, you know, most of it, his memories are kind of more of a, his childhood than, um, you know, my grandparents came actually later in life. So they lived their lives there and, and really that influenced things. Um, they, they are really proud. You know, I, I will say I've definitely made sure to fictionalize the family. Um, my grandmother's family is quite large and there were quite a few sisters. And so I didn't want to, um, you know, there's cousins and I didn't want to write any personal family, you know, things. I did put um, sort of little like vignettes or, or family stories in the books. Um, you see that more with next year in Havana than obviously this book, which is farther in time. But for example, um, there's a story that Luis tells in next year in Havana about his family um, being in the city after Castro has, has taken over and they have a, a pig in the trunk of their car and the car breaks down and they're terrified that someone's going to realize they have this contraband meat. 
And that was actually something that happened to my grandparents um, and my dad when they were in Cuba. And so like little stories like that, um, I've definitely put in the book. Um, the whole story that really sparked next year in Havana was the story of um, burying things in the backyard before you left the country. And that was something my family did do. And my dad telling me that story was what really inspired me to write next year in Havana. You know, that was kind of the, the thing that stuck with me, that idea of, you know, leaving the only home you'd known and, and burying things in your backyard for when you could return. With that, my grandfather was a little bit upset with me, actually, because he did get concerned that people would realize that there were things buried in his house. But I think like by this point, probably anything that that was buried has been found. And I don't write under my my maiden name. So I was like, I think it's probably OK that no one will connect um, to the house in Cuba. But but that was one thing he was a little bit like, oh, maybe you should have you know, not said so that. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So Alyssa would like to know, uh, do you start writing the story as you're doing your research? Since you love the research part, how do you maintain the balance of not getting lost in the research and actually writing your story? That's a good question. That's a really good question and definitely a struggle. Um, so it depends. So with Next Year in Havana, as I mentioned, I would sort of write and then I would stop if there was something I wanted to know more in depth and then I would do some research and then I would keep going with, um, that's kind of how I did when we left Cuba too. And then the last train to Key West, I started doing that and realized it was too challenging because the last train to Key West, um, it's set in the thirties. It's set in the Florida Keys. It's set around the Labor Day hurricane of 1935. And I didn't have as much of a foundation about that as I did kind of the Cuban history of the fifties and sixties. And so that was when I realized it would really help to kind of front load this because there were times with the last train to Key West that I would have to kind of go back and rewrite the narrative because I had my characters taking a ferry, but the ferries actually stopped on a certain day and a certain time because of the storm. And so I'd have to go back and rewrite the scene. So I was like, there has to be a more efficient way um, to do this. So then with Most Beautiful Girl, I, I did the research up front. Um, I think, you know, for me, once again, deadlines do kind of drive things. So I know there's a point where I have to start writing and, and I have to put down the research. And often just because you stop researching from the front loading sense, that doesn't mean that as you're writing, you're not gonna have to go in and fill in things. Cause they're absolutely, you know, one time I was working on Key West and I was describing the soap that someone was wearing and using. And I realized like it was the great depression. So soap probably smelled differently than what I'm gonna think of soap smelling like now. So I had to go, you know, stop and go down a research train of how did they make soap and what was it like during the great depression? Excuse me. So little things like that will definitely um, shape your story. <laughs> Roberta would like to know, and I think this is a really good question too, do your characters ever become a permanent part of you of how you think or live? Sorry, one second. Take your time, take your time. So sorry. Take another drink of water. I'm gonna have a drink of water too. I'm oh, no, sorry. It like never fails. When I have a book release, oh, I get course. sick. Always. Wow. It's um, the stress, I guess, you know? <clears throat> well, and I will admit, I was on deadline right before this one. So it's been kind of back-to-back -back stuff. So um, I definitely find that, that my characters really stay with me. And I think that's probably why you see me kind of revisiting them. So with this family, you know, I wasn't quite ready to say goodbye to them. And so it was really kind of looking for opportunities, going back in the historical record when I could bring them back up and, and when I could kind of appreciate the evolution of this family, <coughs> excuse me, and how it shaped the characters. So definitely, um, I feel like I learned a lot from them. I feel like they're very inspiring. Um, and often they're based in examples that I find in the historical record of real life women, you know, either in my family or in history who, who went through these things. I love hearing writers talk about their characters. Uh, I just love it. I love it because it feels, you know, like they really are alive. You know, you, when you, when you participate in that creation of the character, it, they come from you, but yet, 
they take on a life of their own, which is is fascinating. So they must, you know, they they're definitely connected to you, but you're bringing them to life. It's just, I think it's amazing, truly amazing. Um, so here's another question. Um, there are a group of talented young Cuban American writers. You, Gabby Garcia, Chantel Acevedo, Janine Capo Cruset, etc. They all write about identity and the island in some way. What does this mean, if anything at all? You know, I think a lot of us, and you know, I can't obviously speak for other writers, but just from my experiences personally, I think it's it's kind of when you have these central questions that you're trying to understand about yourself, um, about where you come from, about how where you come from informs you and, and your future. And so I think a lot of writing is really self-exploration. And, you know, with the Cuban experience, it, it is, I think, a little different in some ways because it is um, a diaspora culture where you have the experience of exile. And for so many of us, um, that's had a huge impact on, on our families or on individuals um, who, who went through it themselves. And so I, I think there's a lot to kind of process and unpack there and, and a lot to understand. And for me, you know, all of my books have always been very tied to my identity. Even when I wrote romance, you know, I, I wrote a series about attending an international university in London. I, I wrote a series where uh, one of my heroines is a frustrated law student. So, you know, I think um, putting parts of my experiences and, and my life into my books has just always been something that I've done. Um, and that has, has helped me feel connected to the stories that I tell. And when I started working on Next Year in Havana, you know, it was it was just a part of my identity that I hadn't explored. And I did have questions and, and wanted to understand a little bit better, you know, what it was like for my family, you know, during the revolution, living in, under Castro after the revolution. And I got a perspective that, you know, wasn't the same one necessarily I got in childhood. You know, I think there were things that my grandparents probably didn't want to talk about. There were things my dad didn't know because he was a little boy when a lot of this happened. And so I, I really had such a greater appreciation um, for, you know, the things that made them the way that they were, the things that kind of shaped my family. And, and I think it just helped me kind of understand myself a little better, you know, going through that lens of, of what they went through and, and those experiences. So these questions are still pouring in and we have blown through an hour already, which is incredible. Um, so just someone saying this session has been truly insightful. Both the author and moderator provided an experience unlike any I have attended. Wow. Okay. Thank you both so much. You're so welcome. Thank you for yeah. saying that. That's very nice to hear. I think it has so much to do with, with your generosity. Um, just, how you know just how you poured out so much to us today so thank you so much okay. for joining us thank you for sharing yourself so openly thank you for your work um we're so proud to have all of your books at all of our stores and i just want to remind viewers watching that if you don't already have a copy well today is the birthday so you better order it now press that green button and we'll ship it right out to you and if you're in Miami, come by one of our stores, say hello, and pick up your copy of this and other of Chanel's books. Uh, we have them all. And, and just congratulations, Chanel. Well, thank, thank you for you. joining us. Congratulations from all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This is always such a special stop for me. And I just really appreciate all the support that Books and Books has shown me. And and just these conversations always mean so much to me. And thank you everyone for coming this evening and for your amazing questions. It, it really means a great deal. So thank I, you. You have a lot of fans out there. So thank you. Okay. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Have well. a good evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hasta la vista.